early Greek philosophers, Plato, History and Systems of Psychology, Professor Mike Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno. Plato represents a transitional figure in philosophy, and his work can be divided into two periods. First, he was simply a reporter of Socrates' ideas. He was a groupie. He was one of Socrates' shining students, and he was an aristocratic type Greek. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the second phase of Plato's career, he developed a blend, a hybrid of Socratic philosophy and Pythagorean theorem that he kind of made his own. So let's look at this work. I said, let's look at this stuff. Let me get the PowerPoint moving here. Here we go. Let's go back and briefly look at Pythagorean notions, which are precursors to Plato's major contribution, the notion of the form. So remember back to the Pythagoreans, they believed numbers are real and they influenced the real world, the empirical world, even though they were abstractions and were centered in this abstract place. Now, also, Plato adopted the idea that reality is inferior to the abstract world. Remember, the Pythagoreans thought the abstract world was in perfect harmony. And Plato develops this idea of form. Now, Plato's forms are based on the assumption that everything in the real world is a manifestation of a pure form in the abstract world. Uh, since nothing is perfect in the empirical world, you have to look at where is their perspective, the abstract world. So everything, according to Plato, has kind of this dualistic existence. You have an inferior version in reality or in the empirical world, and then a perfect version of it in the abstract world. Let's explore that in a little bit more detail. So, Plato says that when we experience something, we have an interaction between a pure form and matter. No matter is constantly changing. Think back to Heraclitus, who talked about things being in a st state of becoming constantly. Also, our interactions with the matter change with experience, change with age. We've talked about these things before, so I won't reiterate them. But everything in the empirical world the manifestation of a pure form and some kind of matter that, you know, if you want to put it in more colloquial terms, it's kind of mucking up the pure form. We never see the pure form. Now, forms in Plato's view have their own existence. They are real. Here is my notion of chairs. Now, take a second. I want you to think about a chair. Close your eyes, get an image of a chair. I promise I won't do anything funny when your eyes are closed. Close your eyes and get a chair into your head. Just think about a chair. And there are many, 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 many chairs. Some of them are comfy and have cushions. Some of them are straight back like a dining room office chair. Uh, we have a director's chair there, a beach chair, a Jetsons-like chair, and even a chair that moves a rocking chair. 
We can even call a beanbag chair a chair, but it's not really a chair until you put your seat in it. Each one of these is the manifestation in the empirical world of the form of a chair. Some chairs are more close to an ideal form than others. And what's ideal is in the abstract world where there is this perfect chair. I wish I had that for my desk right now. Love to have the perfect desk chair. Now, even in more modern times, in the 1980s, Eleanor Roche, a Berkeley cognitive psychologist, devised the notion of prototypicality, which doesn't have an abstract and empirical world, but what Roche says is that some things are a better example of a category than others. So if you look at all the chairs on this slide, and there are several chairs there. I hope I turned in the right direction on the video. I'm not getting a preview. Uh, some of those are going to be more, if you would say in Rosh's terms, cherry or have a greater cherry-ness than others of those chairs. Uh, the director chair doesn't have uh, probably not the chair you were thinking of when I had you think about one in your head. It's probably the one that's immediately to your left of my little um, verbal, uh, not verbal, the language there, the Botwin theory of chair forms. That's probably close to being what Rosh would say is a prototypical chair. So even though modern science doesn't necessarily take into account Plato's abstract world, we still have theories that look at things that are better examples of a category than others. And Roche has used prototypicality for all kinds of things. If you think about birds, some birds ha are better examples than birds than others. So if I talk about a robber, robin, not a robber, robin, sparrow, something like that, that's most likely what you're thinking of if I say to think about a bird. If I tell you to think about a bird, I would bet very few of you, the first thing that pops into your head is an ostrich or a penguin or something like that. My mentor, David Boss, and his mentor, Ken Craig, adopted Rosh's view of prototypicality to behaviors. And I still use this in my research program. So we actually get prototypicality ratings of behaviors for different categories. And yes, some behaviors are better representative of a category than others. But that's the personality class. You have to take that one to find out that stuff. Well, Aristotle and many of the Greeks came up with stories to kind of explain their phenomena to everyday people. Because again, remember, most people were illiterate and only the rich were wealthy enough to be educated. But Aristotle wanted to demonstrate the world of empirical places where we live, the empirical world, excuse me, versus the abstract world. So he devised this little story. Now, I'm going to apologize for my picture in advance. It's the best one I've found in a single shot picture. It's a little bit sexist because it has all women chained up in Plato's cave. But um, maybe one of you can artistically render a new one for me. Let's look at this. So Aristotle tells this story. There's a cave, and up at the top it says 
the cave. How about that? And there are several prisoners that um, are shackled to the floor of the cave. Now the cave has a road running through it. And there's a fire behind that road that's perennial. It's always on. And then the cave opens up to sunlight. All the prisoners who can't turn see inside of the cave are the projections of things that go by, the shadows. So these individuals are actually living in a very shadowy world. And you know, if you've ever played around looking at your shadow, as most of us have, you know your shadow is not necessarily a good manifestation of you. So Plato goes along with his story and he says that uh, the people in the cave are making up all these uh, things about what's happening as they're watching the world go by. So they see some people walk by. That's not that big of a deal. The shadow looks like them in some ways. But then a rider comes down the roadway on a horse. Well, you don't see the separate horse. You don't see the separate rider. All you see is the shadow of a horse and rider. And it looks like one thing. So you just start developing these ideas about humans that are fused to horses. Gets even more confusing. Let's say a cart and driver and some mules come down the roadway. Well, you see there's a guy and he seems to be fused to the top of the wagon and the animals pulling it all as one kind of unit. So, basically, the shadow people, the people prisoner in the cave, are only seeing the shadowy world. Well, Plato continues the story by saying one of the prisoners breaks free of their shackles and escapes outside of the cave. Well, first of all, now this individual is in the uh, a different world. And uh, for Aristotle, not Aristotle, sorry, for Plato, this would be the perfect world, the abstract world. So the person escapes and she sees that there's no such thing as a person and a horse fused together. A horse and a rider are different. They see the cart and they see different animals and a human on top of this uh, human-made structure, the cart. Now, because it's an allegory, the prisoner is so excited with what they see they return to the cave and explain to those prisoners that are still shackled what the new reality that they're experiencing is. And as you would imagine, they don't believe her because they've seen the shadows their whole lives. And to finish up the allegory in the way that Plato wrote it. The prisoners are so upset with her new views, with the escapee's views on her new reality, that they kill her. Greek tragedy. So if you take that analogy what Plato is saying is that the philosophers are able to grasp the abstract world somewhat. Because you run out of the cave if you've been locked up all your life and all of a sudden the sunlight really affects your eyes and you really can't see yet. But the escapee is really a philosopher who's learning the truth, tries to take it back to her fellow prisoners. 
and it's very unsuccessful because, well, they kill her. That wouldn't be that much success. So that's another way to look at forms. The forms would be the reality outside of the cave. And the empirical world would be what people shackled to it are seeing on an everyday basis. Well, how do we know this abstract world of forms? Plato says that between existences, when we pass and our body dies, our immortal soul, and we'll talk about the platonic souls in a little bit, dwell in the abstract world of pure forms. Now this also gives you a really important thing about Plato's philosophy. Make sure you get this point down. You dwell as an immortal soul in perfect forms. You learn everything. You experience all of the forms between lives. And then you're reborn into a new body. Now, unfortunately, we don't directly remember everything in the land of the abstract world. But Plato says that if we try hard enough, we can reminisce or we can remember it. So what Plato is saying is that we know everything. All knowledge is inside of us. And all a really good teacher has to do is pull it out of us, which is essentially the Socratic method. You have someone come up to the conclusions that are correct based on this questioning and this constant questioning and bringing out the facts about something, making someone come up with the conclusion themselves. To further talk about this idea, Plato talks about the divided line. It's another one of his stories. There are two worlds. There's the intelligible world, which are the forms, and they're perfect. Then there's what we see, the world of appearances. If you look at the other two things you have objects that you experience and states of mind let's look at this uh, divided line theory thank you thank you thank you I forgot to take the annoying sounds out so you have to put up with uh, them four or five times got the other ones out so images things that we perceive things that we see like you seeing the slide that you're watching right now, your state of mind is imagining. Then we have visible entities, things that we can see, <coughs> excuse me, that we can build beliefs about. And then we go into the intelligible world, things that we have to deduce that are in Plato's abstract world. So mathematical objects. How do we get to those mathematical objects? We think about them. We think about different mathematical relationships, geometric relationships, geometric proofs, algebraic proofs, things like that. And then finally we get to forms and we can know the abstract world by pulling this knowledge we've already got inside of us out. And then ultimately, we have the most important form of all, which I guess deserved a drum roll, the good, which, whoops, which is the perfect form, knowing what is good, knowing what is right through active reasoning. 
So Plato believed we have three components to our soul. First of all, we have the immortal rational soul. This is the soul that exists consistently through time, through different bodies. It's rational and it contains all the information there ever was and is. So even as a psychology major, you have all the knowledge to do complex engineering math in your head. No one's been able to get it out of you. That's the problem. The second soul part of the soul is the bodily soul. He calls this the courageous soul. It's your spiritual soul. It also is where your emotions are. Now, the lowest part of your soul is the appetite of soul and the appetites. And we've talked about how the Greeks used the appetites to talk about basic motivational things. So the basic motivators are things like hunger, thirst, sex, thermal regulation, uh, stuff like that. And these are things that we need. And sometimes... Plato says they get in the way of really knowing things. In fact, he says these three states of soul are always conflicting with each other. If you're tired, if you're sleepy, you have a hard time studying. If you're hungry, and I think that a lot of us eat when we're studying more out of boredom than out of appetite of soul issues. But Plato says these things are always in conflict. If you're thinking about sex too much, you're not thinking about the perfect forms and their manifestations. You're not thinking about rational things. In his famous treatise on a utopian society, Plato talked about different cast of individuals and he thought that the philosopher kings should be individuals selected because they mainly thought rationally all the time and they should be provided for so they didn't have any appetite of needs and then you go down the line from nobility craftsmen all the way to the bottom where you get the base people uh, who are the workers who are always working and worried about food and worried about sex and drinking and living it up and not working and thinking about their higher rational souls. So it's an important part of his theory. In fact, he believed that a truly rational person should be able to control their appetites and emotions. Now, this function of the soul is to focus on rational thought. So, now that I've mentioned food, you should be delaying the gratification of going and getting a cookie and finishing this video on Plato. Uh, this is where you get starting perspectives on aestheticism in philosophers where they should not be driven by basic bodily needs. In fact, Plato saw an inverse relationship between the concerns for bodily experiences and status in society as we've already talked about. To sum them up, and his views as they apply to psychology. And Plato had lots of other interesting things to say. We're giving him very little time here. His supreme goal in life is to free the soul from the adulterations of the flesh. Now, in a couple of units, we're going to get to the early Christians. And you're going to see that a lot of early Christianity is built upon Platonic ideas. 
this is where you get the ideas that eventually form a celibate priesthood and uh, I don't know what to call it, nunhood? The, you know, the religious uh, don't worry about sex, they don't worry about eating and drinking uh, fancy food, they become very aesthetic. So, that's Plato. The last of the big three is Aristotle. And he's going to change the stuff around again. See you next time in the history of psychology. This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael D. Votwin, all rights reserved. You better believe it.